All right, first of all, uh, my name is Father Simeon Gallagher. I am a Capuchin friar for over 50 years. There are questions on this uh, sheet of paper that I find um, very interesting. Someone asks um, about the doctrine of purgatory. This is a, a lovely woman by the name of Holly Hustler. She actually raised a number of questions. And um, this issue of purgatory, of course, this is um, an element of our theological understanding. It has a deep scriptural roots as far back as the book of Maccabees, uh, where they prayed uh, for those who had died. And um, both the Council of Trent in the 15th century and a council before that in the 14th century, the Council of Florence, uh, speaks about this whole issue of purgatory. Many of the images that we have of this uh, come primarily from literary people, believe it or not, like uh, Dante in his very famous uh, book, uh, long book, a long poem, The Divine Comedy. He divides uh, life into the Inferno, into the Purgatorio, and finally into the Paradiso. And he gives us vivid images, but those images of purgatory, uh, maybe with burning flames and so forth, are not really and truly to be found in the scriptures. We are grateful for literary people like Dante who help us to picture this and also the mystical revelations of individual saints. If I were to place the understanding of purgatory in a relational model, it would be to say that even in the best of marriages, even in the happiest of families, even in the deepest of friendships, there are moments when we don't often treat each other with the kind of civility and decency and respect that we ought to. And there are ruptures in the integrity of the relationship. That mistake, that sin, that self-absorption has got to be purged before they can come once again to the fullness of the relationship that they had with each other from the beginning. That relational understanding of purgatory, it seems to me, is one of the, the, the ways of explaining this that makes sense. We live good lives, we struggle to be good people, but sometimes we don't do too well. We die and we go into the embrace of God. But that um, residue of our selfishness has got to be washed away, got to be purified before we can come into the presence of the all-loving and all-merciful God. Holly also, interestingly enough, asked a question coming from the world of uh, Marian theology, the theology about the Blessed Mother. Uh, one of the, not new devotions, but one of the emphasized devotions to Mary that has come with Pope Francis is a devotion in honor of Our Lady called the Untire of Knots. Um, it sounds uh, kind of comical, but in reality, it's a beautiful devotion. It comes from the 17th century, and it's rooted in marriage. Uh, there was a young couple who went into their marriage with great love and devotion to one another, and then over the course of three to five years, the marriage began to become problematic. In Germany, although I have seen this in my own ministry, with the Hispanic community, uh, where they wrap the couple in the Hispanic community. When I was pastor, I saw this. They wrap the couple in a very large rosary. Um, in Germany, in the 17th century, when a couple pronounced their wedding vows, they were bound together, their hands were bound together with a white ribbon. And that w ribbon, of course, uh, was symbolic of their commitment to one another. And so this young couple in the 17th century in Germany began to develop problems. And rather than throwing in the towel and uh, walking away from each other, they began to seek a solution in prayer. Interestingly enough, the young bride, every time that they had a serious argument, she took that white band with which their hands were wrapped when they were married 
and she tied a knot in it <laughs> just to symbolize the argument or the discussion or the problem and uh, this became very difficult this marriage but they sought the help of God they sought the help of good priests and um, at one point this priest took this knotted rope this knotted ribbon uh, to a, a picture of the Blessed Mother Our Lady of the Snows believe it or not and um, this prayer of his to help this couple and to undo the knots was miraculously accomplished and the knots came out of uh, the ribbon. Is Mary called our only hope in the untire of knots novena? I went through that booklet last night trying to find a specific reference to this and I would call this little book to your attention. You can get it in any religious bookstore. I cannot see anywhere in here where that specific title is given to her, the sole hope, the only hope for the undoer of knots, but she certainly is a powerful, a powerful intercessor. Is there a particular Capuchin theologian who articulates that unique Capuchin spirituality? And I must answer that in all honesty by saying no, there is not, which is not to say that there haven't been great Capuchin teachers. In fact, one of the great men of our order, the Capuchin branch of the Franciscan order, is St. Lawrence of Brindisi, who was a doctor of the church. His feast day is the 22nd of July, if I'm not mistaken. And when you look at what this man did, his leadership, his scholarship, his writings, he gives us a particular understanding of um, the Capuchin unique contribution, but we have an enormous number of beatified men and, sanct and canonized saints in the Capuchins, and we look to them rather than to one specific theologian uh, to guide us and to inspire us and to challenge us for our own time.